All right, one more issue um, in terms of uh, the things that people are saying, hey, this is proof that we need to do it differently, right? This is, this is proof that freedom doesn't work in some capacity. Uh, and then I think we'll go to how a capitalist government would deal with this, or capitalism would deal with this. And then we'll take a few questions. I might not take all the questions because I really do need to run and go help my wife with, uh, with uh, stocking up. But, um, you know, good example of disrupting our values. But uh, so I'm getting a lot of messages in, 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 the, in the super chat as well and everywhere else. Oh, this is proof that globalization is bad. This is proof that we need to build everything at home because we're short on X, Y, Z, fill in the blank of what we're short that's being manufactured in country X, Y, Z, primarily China because we like to beat up on China. But, but in China or somewhere else, so we're dependent on this, dependent on that. And we can't produce it at home. Therefore, we must bring all production home so that we can make sure that in emergencies, the one in a 80 year or 10 year or 15 year time, we will have everything we need to cope with this situation. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is equivalent to saying in my situation right now in Puerto Rico, why the hell did my ancestors ever leave the subsistence farm? Life would be so much easier if I had a farm out here in the Puerto Rican hills and I was growing all my food and I didn't have to rely on the supply chain that the supermarkets are engaged in. I wouldn't have to rely on, on all these, uh, you know, on, on, on companies that might be shutting down and other things. I could just take care of myself and just, just, just produce everything that I need well, and or not rely on them. Yeah, but there's also the dimension that, so when we're talking about capitalism, I mean, capitalism is the system that emerges from the protection of individual rights. And that's often lost. People just think capitalism is people doing whatever they, they feel like and for money. And so if you look at part of the job under capitalism of a government under which capitalism emerges is to define rights, including things like if other countries are bringing over things, like they have practices where they have bats, you know, in their food and stuff. That's the kind of thing our government should have an interest in and should be vigilant uh, about. So often I think the way we deal in trade, the government isn't always thinking through all the potential rights violations. But I mean, just the productive ability gain that you get from being able to deal with 7 billion other people around the world versus not, I mean, that is, that is so many years to your life in, in uh, every dimension. This is kind of a funny example, but you would like it like this show, Mr. You can hear me now, right? Yep, yep. The show Mr. Sunshine that you turned me on to, like I heard somebody say, you know, like, oh, why, you know, we only want American shows and stuff. And I'm just thinking, how amazing is it that kind of um, people who embody kind of the best of what America stands for are creating things uh, around the world. And you just think, oh, isn't it amazing that we can trade with over uh, 7 billion people, including, by the way, we can trade with them to benefit when we do idiotic things ourselves, like Green New Deal. I mean, part of the reason of our standard of living is we're trading with China, who's smart enough to use lower cost energy more consistently uh, than we are. So I think that you can look for ways in which rights can be better uh, defined. But I mean, it's, it's just, it's a, tr you have to think about your productive ability is like a fundamental determinant of your ability to survive and flourish. And trade is essential to that. Human interaction is essential to that for, for many people. Energy is essential to that. And we see across the board, people are just ignoring life requires production. And so your productive ability is the fundamental. And that's why freedom is fundamental to all those values. And it goes back to, it also goes back to something you said earlier about, um, the emergency is the, the dealing with the emergency is the number one value in life, right? So mm -hmm. now we have to shut down trade in order to fall when there's an emergency. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to sacrifice years of our lives in normal life years in order to deal with a once in a lifetime kind of situation where there's an emergency. Not to mention that the whole thing is bogus, right? So the fact is that, um, even if we brought back production to the United States, let's say of, I don't know, anything, masks, right? There's only so much you could scale production in the United States if all the masks were being made in the United States. But the fact that you can scale them up, you can scale them up much faster in China and you can scale them up much faster in lots of other countries. We could be importing masks from all kinds of countries right now who are really actually scaling up production. It's not just our 
ability to scale up in one geographic area. You're taking advantage of multiple geographic areas of, of the ability to scale. The profit motive works on a global scale. Uh, demand for certain products is going to increase during an emergency, which means capital will flow into those, into those industries. Uh, labor will flow into those industries. There'll be a huge increase in supply of those products. Nobody's going to... Now, again, if China's an enemy country and it wants to see the United States crushed by the virus and it restricts the ability of their companies to sell us stuff, then, you know, that's a problem. If we believe that, then we should treat China as an enemy. Okay, that, that's a whole different foreign policy issue. But in a normal course of events, Chinese companies want to make money. They sell us the stuff on large scales. Um, so the whole idea that A, you sacrifice normal life for the emergency is nuts. And secondly, in an emergency, you want supply chains that are robust, that are working well. I mean, one of the first things I would have done if I were president would be lower tariffs to zero as soon as an emergency happened. I would have done that well before this. But one of the best things to do in an emergency is to take out any restraints on trade, any restraints on production, any restraints on people able to voluntarily supply the goods that are necessary in order to deal with the crisis. And just one quick comment is with the normal life, you can think of it from an objectivist perspective it's the you know the interference with the pursuit of values that is the emergency like that's what we regard as this is that's the worst thing you can do is prevent i mean so in any kind of sustained way you have a, a weight to that versus no the only thing that can happen is some sort of human caused threat and so all we need to do is we just need to restrict our action infinitely so that we don't make a mistake that ends up hurting us so let's talk about how capitalism would deal with the pandemic. What would happen under capitalism? Um, and what would happen, you know, in a, with a proper government limited to its role as protecting individual rights. That, that is, so what, what individual rights, how does individual rights apply to something like a pandemic? Well, I mean, so the, the major examples I've been thinking of, I already mentioned, so I'm, I'm curious to see yours. Cause I mean, I, I mentioned Certainly, just the broad idea of it's, it's rational individuals using their own judgment. They define what yep. health and healthcare are, and then they get to control the production and pursuit of it. So that obviously applies to tests. It applies to the scaling uh, of hospitals. I think there's, there's one other interesting dynamic, which maybe you could shed more light on, which is just it, there should be a huge amount of profit incentive to help people here. And it seems like in many cases they're being told, oh, just give this away. Like I want, if, if my life is at stake or other people's lives are at stake, I want to be able to pay a fortune. I want people to be able to make a fortune to uh, cure this. So I'm really interested in other dynamics that you've noticed or, or thought about. Yes. So let me, let me just, let me just say this. So the role of a government in a pandemic like this is very limited. It's limited to protection of rights. And that means it's limited to restricting the ability. So, so restricting the ability of people who actually are a threat to other people from being mobile. So if you carry the virus, if, you, if, if we know you have the virus, you should not be out there flying on planes and doing other things. This is, by the way, why it's so important to have tests. Testing, for example, if, if I could test myself before a flight, and, you know, before I left and before every trip, then it would be much safer for me and it would be much safer for everybody else because I would know this is okay to fly because I don't have the virus. And now it's not okay to fly. I should stay home. Um, you know, there was a case where uh, this guy was on, um, went on a flight at JetBlue. Now, initially it was reported that as he left the flight, he told the flight attendants, oh, by the way, I've got coronavirus. Now, it turned out that he had been tested before they took off I guess a couple of days and he got the results while he was in the air. Oh, and I see. Now he shouldn't have flown anyway, if he was, if he suspected, but let's say, you know, in a, in a capitalist country, somebody like that is on a flight and uh, gets off and says, Hey, I I'm, I'm Corona positive. Somebody like that should be arrested. I mean, that's criminal because he's clearly endangering the values of lives of the people around him. He is acting, you know, he knows he has the information. He knows, he should be arrested and prosecuted. That's criminal. Uh, somebody could die on that flight for getting the virus from him. 
So the government's job is to quarantine those people that we know have the virus or to make sure they quarantine themselves. But this is with a certain level, right, of, I mean, because it can't be, well, if, if you have a cold, then the government gets to say you can't move. And part of it should be, you know, private institutions sure. setting their own. I mean, so there's a certain level at which if it was like super contagious Ebola, where the guy dies immediately, it's kind of obvious. And then this, this seems to be a case where it's warranted, but it's, it's not, there has to be some threshold that's, that's Absolutely. And this, rational. And this is where it's hard, right? So none of these things are easy. And, and the whole idea that government is limited to protection of individual rights, that sounds easy and straightforward. No, the, you have to figure out what does violation of individual rights mean in this context? Is giving somebody a cold a violation of their rights? Not really. I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly not a good thing, but it's so inevitable. It's so, you know, to re restrict people's ability to move if they've got a cold would be so debilitating to civilization that it's just absurd. So where is the limit? That's why we need experts. We need real experts in the science. We need real experts in applying science to the question of individual rights. And we need somebody to be able to say, yes, this is actually an emergence. This is, this is, a, this is a real threat. There really is something here. Uh, Ebola is a clear example, although Ebola is very hard to transmit from human to no, human. No, no, I was just saying if- yep. Yes, if it was that deadly, then it's clear cut. If it's cold, clearly it's not an emergency. Coronavirus, probably qualifies, but you'd have to have some, some, some meat there. You'd have to have some real arguments. You couldn't just arbitrarily do it. So the government would have a role in defining this as, hey, yes, this is, this is what qualifies as violating rights. We're letting you know. And they would have to be objective about it and they have to communicate about it so that we would know when, what they consider violation of rights. That's what objective law requires. Well, I have, so I have a, a challenge to that, or, or at least there, because I think, so, I mean, one thing is if it's doing that part of it, it has to incorporate all the things we've mentioned before. So it has to really value normal productive life. It can't act like we're doing this out of, but well, we're talking about a, 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 a capitalist government right, but that has the right. I mean, it's ultimately based on, on values and do you yes. value production and do you value the pursuit of happiness? But one thing I've been thinking of is if we actually had protection of rights across the board, that means there wouldn't be, everything wouldn't be this common area that then it's the government's jurisdiction, the plane, the airports, the streets. Yeah. These would be places where they could set their own private policies. And then the burden of proof for a government would be something like something that's so airborne that it cuts across people's property very easily. And then you have to adjudicate it. So I think if you had more capitalism, these things would be much more resolved. Uh, yes, and there'd be a incentive for like the airlines to, to produce policies and make them clear. Yeah. For, for the owner of the street to announce or the owner of the restaurant, okay, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not welcome here if you- And you could choose where to go. Yeah, although, of course, because, because some of these things you can't test and um, you can't test very quickly and it's hard to know if you have it or not. So, but, but private individuals would, would figure out. And again, again, because this is primarily deadly to older people, it would be pretty clear. Old people shouldn't go out. It shouldn't be imposed by the government, but it should just be a clear incentive for them not to go out. And they, in a sense, taking on a risk. If they are going out, and it's their responsibility, it's their risk that they're taking on. In terms of industry, I think, I think here, you know, you could get the imagination go wild. Who, who has an incentive, profit incentive, to um, restrict the spread of the virus, to make sure that people get um, get well quickly and efficiently uh, and uh, to make sure there are enough hospital beds to make sure that that actually all this the entire supply chain associated with the virus functions efficiently and well I mean there's one industry that is really should be vested in this and have a profit incentive around this and that's the insurance industry I mean, insurance companies would play a huge role in these kind of situations, right? They have an interest in testing because if you test, then, they, then you can self-isolate and it won't spread and they won't have to pay the hospital bills for lots of people. Uh, they have an interest in getting the people who are really sick quickly into a hospital so that they can be treated as early as possible so they don't deteriorate, so they have to do the most expensive stuff, which is kind of the ICU stuff. 
They have an interest in getting a vaccine quickly. So they have an interest in increasing their own investment in vaccine. They have an interest in antivirals so that we can quickly give, get antivirals to as many people as possible and cure them and get them out of hospital, which is very expensive for an insurance company. So insurance companies have a massive interest here. And I think, I think this is true in so many different realms that it's hard to imagine in a free market how important insurance would be more broadly. Uh, you know, you can think about fires, you can think about, you can think about uh, safety in the roads, who has an incentive to have people drive safely. Well, insurance companies, because if you don't drive safely, they're the ones who actually pay the bills often. Um, there's all kinds of ways in which insurance companies are motivated in a truly capitalist economy to make sure the products that we're buying and selling are, are, are good products or safe products, um, to make sure, you know, the, you, you could imagine that instead of, uh, instead of the NFDI, uh, uh, an FDA insurance companies would hire labs to check drugs that they would then be approved by the insurance companies to be, to be given to people in consultation with doctors because that's what they would cover. And you could go on and on and on in the different ways in which a business like insurance is incentivized to re reduce its expenses, maximize its profits, and therefore participate in an active way in the entire supply chain, which is the delivery of health or the delivery of health care, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just so, man, it's just these, and, and I would just say as, you know, as a both of us, you know, we're gonna be more prosperous than the average person in part just living in, you know, in the freest part of the world, but even within that. And, you know, the thing that most affects us is the, our longevity is the lack of freedom in medicine. Like that's the thing where one of us will die of something and then 10 years later, there will be a cure for it. And it's because people slowed down uh, progress. Like for Absolutely. sure, that's where the leverage is. Science and all of this stuff that people don't even invest in, don't even go into because the FDA has basically said, we're not interested. We're not going to prove that. Think about all the dollars that would go, all these billionaires who are spending money going to Mars they might be spending money on life extension. They think that they could get by the regulation to go to Mars. I'm not convinced of that. But you know, they know they can't get by the regulations to produce life extension stuff. So they put some money into it, but imagine the flood of capital that would go into that if the FDA was not involved, if the FDA was not, you didn't need permission in order to do science and produce products that were actually extending uh, human life. So. Absolutely. I mean, the way in which, and this is what is really scary about the whole Medicare for all and, and government takeover of healthcare. If we think it's bad now, it's like a, a million times worse when the government takes over the entire healthcare system. And the fact is that the rest of the world still relies on the U.S. for medical innovation, for, for new treatments, for, for new ways of thinking about disease, because our doctors are relatively free. And, and they have, you know, it's a, re, you know, we are in a sense subsidizing the entire world, it's healthcare systems, because we are still free and they are not. And when we are gone, then there's nobody to, there's nobody to subsidize our healthcare system. There's nobody to innovate. There's nobody to come up with new treatments. There's nobody else out there in the world. There's no way to go to, to, to get freedom in healthcare, which is so crucial to individual life. I mean, kind of one promising area is just the digital revolution and, you know, mental sort of machine power, which they call AI, which is not really the right way to think yeah. of it. But in terms of these machines that can really amplify our mental abilities, that's pretty exciting. And then in, in part, probably some of the relaxation of things in response to this may lead to some of the evolution of medicine, including you mentioned, oh, you can now have a doctor in Colorado who didn't come from Colorado, more of the telemedicine. I mean, just think about there's no way that it would all be these like doctor visits where you're paying your $30. It's just these random stuff versus yeah. all the stuff we're doing digitally. So I, I think that there's just so much. I have one comment about uh, objectivism and, and all of this. So we could think of capitalism as what, what would it look like if we had real capitalism? But I've thought about in this crisis in particular, what would it be like if say there were 10 times the penetration or prevalence of objectivist philosophy. And I think of, okay, what are, with, with the things we've been talking about, I mean, in terms of one thing objectivist philosophy offers is really good methodology for understanding and by implication explaining things. 
And how much better off would we be if there were a lot of people who could clearly explain what's going on? I mean, we have, we're fortunate, we have our friend Amish Adalja, who's yep. been helpful, but imagine, Imagine you had dozens uh, of of people like that, and and then if you think about it's, now your your uh, thinking methods are going to be related to your values because how are you even deciding what the values are when you're when you're explaining something? Well, people who really value individual lives and the pursuit of happiness and can give us risks in that context, and then you know related to that is just causal principles, uh, being able to explain the way things work and the way they interrelate with a lot of precision. I mean, the way people just throw around all these terms like, oh, this is exponential and this is, it's just not the level of, of clarity. And so one thing I find that as an objectivist intellectual myself, I find this as a kind of inspiring, but also a challenge to think about, okay, how can this way of thinking be spread so that there are specialists in different fields who can bring clarity? And it's part of what I've tried to do with the energy issue and associated and environmental issues but I, I'm really feeling like oh, I wish, I wish there were more people who had this because it makes it so hard to make these life and death decisions. And the other philosophical perspectives or, or lack of perspectives just aren't doing the job. So our whole knowledge system just isn't isn't giving us something that's nearly as good as what I know is possible based on what objectivism makes possible. I, I mean, I think absolutely. It's it's and it's. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we had right now people who who, because right now I think there's a lot we don't know about this virus. I mean, it's, there's a lot that is still weird to me um, in terms of how it's spreading, in terms of why it's doing, why it's spreading in one way in Italy and a different way in China and South Korea. And and, and the, the Brits, the, the uh, uh, Johnson's government is treating this completely differently and they've got a whole different approach to it that's based on behavioral science and some statistical modeling that they're doing, which is completely different. And I'm finding just reading about all these different things and what they're doing, it's bewildering to me exactly what is going on and what is the real science behind it and what is what is voodoo and what is real. And um, and it would be great if we had specialists uh, and Amish is swamped, so he, he can only do so much. But if we had specialists in all these sub sub feels that could actually, you know, enlighten us in terms of what is actually going on so we can make better value judgments about our own lives because it is kind of spooky what's going on. To what extent could this evolve? Can what, it, can what extent to this could really be a, vi a, a, a threat to our lives? Uh, I mean, we don't know because we don't have the kind of clear presentation of science that would be required for us to, to have real visibility in what the level of threat really is. Um, and it's very frustrating. And reading about it, it's so difficult to find any kind of really good information about what's going on in the world. Yeah, Other, well, I, than, I other than just what the government is saying, which is, which is it's impossible to, to know the value of, of the information they, they bring out. This is, this is slightly... Uh promotional, but like I've been working for a while on the second version of the moral case for fossil yep. fuels. And part of it is I've, I've brought in more like objectivist talent to help me think through some of the stuff. And, you know, it'll be out, I think at some point next, definitely at some point next year by then, but it's like, I'm really seeing my, I just, you know, what, what I try to try to give people an energy, what I would want anywhere, which is a really clear account including that takes into, that helps you make sense of all the different conflicting claims you hear. Part of it is you read these articles and they're so disjointed and you don't know how one thing relates yep. to the other. You don't know how to, and so part of what you would want is for each presentation to be engaging the most plausible arguments of the others and showing where uh, they're going wrong. So if, if anyone has any recommendations of, of people who are actually doing this, you know, you can email me at alex at alexepstein.com or email you're on, but I mean, it, just to find one or two or three really good thinkers would could save so much. Absolutely. And, and in any, you know, imagine if there were thousands or millions so that every field had real objective thinkers in them. I mean, it just, it would be, it's hard to imagine what a truly capitalist, truly free world looks like, but. Um, it doesn't even need to be, we don't even need it to be totally free. We just need more of young, smart people to be excited. Every about yeah, every increment that, that gets us closer to that or gets more people thinking properly is going to improve our lives dramatically. You know, yeah. I was going to say exponentially, but, 
but you know, I'm not sure everybody knows what that means, but it, dramatically, you know, and really exponentially, because it does work exponentially. Brain power works exponentially. Uh, it's why having more humans on the planet is a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, let's see. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. Using the super chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourownbookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show. And, um, and and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to keep this uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next.